because of what you've done and every time that Bible is open the word of God says it will not come back void so only heaven will be able to tell us what last week's gift how it's going to affect eternity so let's keep on keeping on as we go to the Lord in prayer brother Jeff would you be so kind please dear Heavenly the Father we come to you with honor praise and glory the name of your son Jesus Christ and the ultimate sacrifice he made for all of us on the cross dear Lord it's a crazy, mixed up, messed up world we're living in right now. But you told us these things would happen. And you said they would pass. So, Lord, we're going to keep our focus on you. On your word. On your guidance. On your wisdom. On what you want for us. And how we should move forward in faith and love. So, dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless those that give today and that blessing go forth and bless others. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
time he lives. Amen? Amen. Because we'll live, we can live alongside him. Let's stand once again. Turn to 298, hymn number 298, God Leads Us Along, number 298. First, second, and last verse. In shading pastures of bread and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the waters of love makes the weary we must be, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the way on. Sometimes on down through the sun, just no cry, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley and darkness of night, God needs his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Away from the fire and away from the play, God leads his dear children along. On the way up in glory, eternity day, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Aren't you glad that whatever you're going through, you're not alone for all those problems? Oh, I don't know if I can help make it as life as it is today without the Lord's help. 431, hymn number 431. I love to tell the story. First verse, second verse, first. I love to tell the story of unseen things above. Of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story. Because I know it's true, it satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, will be my name in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love.
tell me the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story. Will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. We can give you a hearty amen. 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 Well, Edmund, you may be seated. Luke chapter 19. Luke. Precious word. Luke chapter 19 in God's precious word. We're going to read this portion of scripture that talks about Palm Sunday. And I'll give some comments about it as we go along. We'll kind of see how the Lord directs us. And I want to continue, if the Lord should allow me to, to incorporate more of these actual uh, descriptions of our Christianity, the many facets of what it means to be a child of God. Luke chapter 19, look at verse 28, and it says this. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethany and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into a village over against you, and the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, wherein yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man, I'm verse 31 of Luke chapter 19. And if any man ask you, why do you lose him? Thus shalt ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto him, why loose ye the colt? And they said, the Lord hath need of them, a need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. And they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereupon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come, nigh, even now at the descent to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. So one of the reasons why he was, they were rejoicing, because they were excited to see what they had saw, and they knew that greater things were in their future because they believed that Jesus was going to be that conquering king that the nation of Israel wanted to be re have Rome removed from their country. Saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto him, if I, t I tell you that, that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, I've talked about this before, and I'll, I'll, I'll read this in a moment. Can you imagine if God's people so became mute in their praise of God that as we walked outside this parking lot or went to other parking lots like ours, and all of a sudden we see these stones out there rejoice? That would be kind of freaky, wouldn't it? It would be kind of scary. But he's saying just as, as miraculous as that would be is that the fact is that we should praise him on a continual basis for not just what we've seen, but what we've experienced, but what we are going to experience in the future. So the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known even thou at least in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace, but how they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and cabass thee about round and keep thee on every side. and shall lay even, thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in one in thee one stone upon another because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. As he's continuing throughout this, this trek towards Mount Calvary, as he's walked through the town, he looks at the people and he begins to weep. He's saying, you have no idea what's coming. That coming in the future, that you're going to be surrounded by the enemy. They're going to destroy the city and not one stone's going to be upon another. Another portion of scripture says, he looked across Jerusalem, he said this, 
O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets, how, how often I'd have gathered thee as a hen that gathered her chicks. But she would not. Can you imagine the heartbreak of Jesus? He came into his own, and the Bible says, his own received him not. He spent and lived among the Jews. Now, occasionally from what we see, the snapshots, there were a few Gentiles that were, that were touched and healed, but he mainly came to the Jews, and they rejected him. He's warning them that something bad's going to happen, and he's also weeping because he wanted them to come towards him for protection, for guidance, direction for oversight, but they chose to reject him and what they rejected with Jesus, they chose the law. Jesus was the completion of the law, but they chose, they chose the law over Jesus and he was heartbroken over that. Verse 28 says, and when he had thus spoken, he went before sending, oh, I read that. Verse, 30, verse 37, as they went come nigh, even at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice of all the mighty works that they had seen. And let's, let's go down to verse 45. It says, and he went into the temple, began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought. I would love to see, and I hope and pray that God has video clips of his life on this earth. There's different things I'd like to see, but I would like to be able to see because the world portrays Jesus as this, this non-male figure that he has no backbone and that he does, he's not able to stand up against anything. Now we see that he walks into the temple and he literally, as he sees the temple, as it, and as they get, as people walked into the temple, they would have places that they could be able to, to buy different sacrifices to be able to take that they could sacrifice for sins or other things like that. But the problem why he got mad was is that they were taking, these people were taking the money and profiting themselves. They were using religious articles and using it for a personal use. They're profiteering on the name of God. And he got angry. It says, and he began to cast them out that sold therein and them that bought, saying in the, un, unto them, it is written, my house is the house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. Notice what Jesus says, that the, the main aspect of the church of God should be prayer. See, it's that prayer that we talk to God about all of our problems. It's that prayer that lifts us up out of despair. It's the prayer that gives us encouragement to know that although we may not see it, but the light is at the end of the tunnel. As you keep marked toward God's going to take care of all those different things. It's the aspect of God's people talking to an almighty God as a child where there would be to their father, being open and honest and, and just brokenhearted and sharing every aspect about themselves to an almighty God. And it says, and he taught daily in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes, the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could not find what they might do. They couldn't figure out a way to be able to destroy Jesus, and this is why. For all the people were very attentive. They just weren't attentive. They were very attentive. They were honed in on every word that Jesus had to say. They were watching his hand motions. They were listening to the inflection of the voice. And they were watching his body language. And they, they were so focused on him that the, the Pharisees and the scribes and all the distractions that were trying to get the people to turn Jesus in, they weren't paying attention because they were honed in on Jesus. Would to God that 2,000 years later, we'd be so attentive that God would say that we'd be very attentive to hear him. The fact of Palm Sunday is this. Jesus willingly 
He knows the heart of people, willingly allowed himself to go before his captors, willingly allowed them to take him, abuse him, mock him, beat him, humiliate him, parade him through the Via Della Rosa, downtown Jerusalem, completely naked, watch him ca help carry a cross all the way up to Mount Calvary, willingly lay down and let them put the nails in his hands and his feet, willingly listen to the people, they'll crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, and yet in his heart he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. While the people mocked and denied and cursed his name, you had a few that saw, because they're very attentive, and said, surely this is the Son of God. See, the world is full of distractions. The world is looking for every one of us to, to focus on everything else. But if we hone in on, on Jerusalem, you know, it's amazing to me how we live in a world that denies Christ except when they can make some money off of him Christmas and Easter. Do we know when he was at? We don't know the exact dates. I've had people say, well, why do you celebrate Easter? Why do you celebrate? Those are carnal days. Well, guess what? It's a day that the world recognizes Jesus, and so I have no problem celebrating Jesus the same day. So I'm not going to get caught, I'm not going to get caught up in that type of argumentation that's out there. Because we don't look at an, an empty tomb, except we're very attentive, is that the purpose of the empty tomb is that Jesus said, I've conquered death, hell, and the grave, and I am the resurrection, the life. And so because of me, because of what I've done, if you will accept what I've done and give me the gift of God, then I can take you to a place called heaven because I'm the door to heaven. Very attentive. And as we continue on this path of understanding the different facets of our Christianity, if we pay attention to our Christianity, I think sometimes we think, well, I'm saved, that's good enough to get to heaven. But the Bible says we're supposed to have a, an answer of the hope that lies within us. If someone tells me, why are you a Christian? What would you say? What is What about Christianity so enamors you to want to follow, to want to devote, to want to give every part of your life to him? What makes you do that? What, what causes all that? And we ought to be able to say, this is why I follow Christ. Not because of some man tells me to, because of a personal experience a meeting with him and receiving what he had for me accepting it and devoting my life because my life changed immediately and my life is better and I want to continue experience how great of a God is from what I read in the scriptures but not just my prayer life not just listen to the Christians but also from my faith and believing what God has done for me on a day-by-day -day basis so we started on this one right here. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We'll look at the word miraculous. Miraculous. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 20. It says this. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Miraculous. When you look at your life pre-salvation to post-salvation, was not a miracle involved there? You see, the Bible says he goes to us and he reached down to the miry pits as deep as he needs to go and picks us up. And guess what? As he's picking us up, we're dirty. We're filthy. We've been scarred by the world. We have all the pain and all the hurt and all the anguish and all the regrets of what the world has brought us through. And he takes us anyway. You see, people say, well, I've got to get myself cleaned up before Christ will accept me. That's not what the Bible says. He reaches in that miry pit and he picks us up 
Then as he picks us up, he establishes on a solid rock. Have you ever walked on something that was muddy? And it seemed like the more you walked, the greasier the mud got. I know when I lived in Oklahoma City, that's just that red clay is horrible when it gets wet. Literally, you can spin your, spin your wheels and go nowhere. That's exactly how, in, a, in a picture of the world. We could be trying to get where we want to get to. We get nowhere because it's miry, it's oily, it's slick. We get no traction. He picks us up, puts us on a solid rock. He cleans us up. He gives us new words to say, and he gives us new songs to say, a new mentality because the Bible says we get the mind of Christ. He gives us a heart. He takes the heart of stone that's been created by all the rejection of the world that we've dealt with, and he takes that heart of stone, and he gives us a fleshly heart that has feelings, and has emotions, and has the ability to share the love of Jesus Christ as we have been experiencing in our own personal lives. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. So an aspect of a miracle, look at Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 21. <clears throat> the Bible says this. Verse 20 says, for our conversation. Anytime you see in the New Testament the word conversation, it's not talking about two people talking back and forth. That word conversation means lifestyle. We used to hear in Bible college, your walk talks, and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. See, say that again. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. For our conversation is in heaven. Do you know that every day we're, we sing that we're marching to Zion, Every day we're one day closer, one step closer to this place called heaven. For once also we, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Do you know that we get to heaven, this flesh we have right here, the flesh that is full of hurt and sickness and pain and arthritis, and memories we regret that seem like we can't escape, it's going to be washed away. The blood that runs through our body, God's got to get rid of it. We're going to get a blood infusion with the blood of Jesus Christ because our blood can rot and no, nothing that gets to heaven can rot. We're going to change our vile bodies into the glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So every day as we march towards Zion, God is fashioning us and working with us. And the Bible says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works. And every day he makes us that much a little bit better like Jesus Christ. Say, so, well, what is it going to be like when we see Jesus? Well, you know what he brought from this old earth? He brought the nail scars. Let's think of how humbling it's going to be. We walk up to Jesus, and we see the nail prints. The one he took for us, he didn't deserve it. He carried them up to heaven as an eternal reminder what his love did for you and for me. Can you imagine that? The fact is that when the Bible says it's here, it's going to be completely white. Why? Because it's a scientific fact that the cross and all the, all the stress and all the problems of the cross literally changed his hair color. Why did he do all that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a miracle. Because that when I got saved, I was an unlovable person. I was almost six, I was sixteen years old. I was doing lots of things that sixteen year olds should not do. Why? Because I had an emptiness in my heart, and I was trying to fill that heart with all the different self destructive behaviors that teenagers are doing at that time. 
I had no relationship with my parents. I was by myself. Although I lived with them, there's a lot of bad things that's going on in the home. So I was trying to figure out my where where do I fit in this whole world? And every way I tried to, I got knocked down. I felt like, what's the use of even living? But I'm glad I went to church, heard about Jesus. I'm glad that I heard the message, heaven or hell, it's your decision. When I heard the fact that it was my decision, that I could have that whole field, and I could be able to begin to get whole and be able to live a better life, a satisfied life, a peaceful life, a, a life of a purpose and passion and life, I wanted that. It was a miracle. Because the person that was trying to get me to church, I slashed his tires one day. One day I put sugar in his gas tank. Now, we had a 1976 Ford LTD. You say, well, what does that got to matter? Well, I went when he was inside the house talking to my sisters. I opened up his car and opened up the hood. And I took all the different spark plug wires that was on the distributor cap, and I moved them all around. When he got back in his car, his car didn't start. I did other things besides that. Why? Because I didn't want this man to affect my life because he was, he was bothering me. It's a miracle he kept coming. See, the fact is this, when you look at your Christian life and you look at what God had to go through with all the different barriers and doors and ways that we said, we don't want you, God. We have a perceived idea of what it means to be a Christian, and we don't want to go down that pathway. And God says, you know what? I don't care how far you want to go. I'm going to pursue you, and if you'll just give me a moment, I can change your life. Yes, there's still people on the run. There's still deniers. They're still rejectors, but it doesn't change the fact that he's not going to keep coming after them. And then when we accept him, we stop. He changed our life. Like, wow. Why did I do all that stupidity? And I've got to go back to Jacksonville, North Carolina, 48 East Drive, a mile off of the Camp Lejeune main gate on Highway 17. Live in this little brown house, about a block and a half, was Holy Spirit Catholic School and Church. Right across the street was First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, North Carolina. And every Sunday I'd get up and I'd go to Mass and I'd be an altar boy. And, uh, and as I'd come out of, of, of church, I'd hear laughing, I'd hear singing, and I'd hear all kinds of excitement going on. And I remember going home and saying, Mom... Is there any way that I can go to that other church? Why, well, they invited you? No, then you don't go. So if they invite me, I can go one time. That was first and second grade. Not one invitation. We left and our lives became hell after that. With alcohol and abuse in the home. What if someone from the First Baptist Church saw me or saw my sister or saw my, saw my mom because that was in Vietnam and all the, if they would have just said, hey, would you just come one time? What changes could have happened from first grade when I was six until I was almost, I was a junior at the age of 16? What miracles could have happened? Now I'm glad that even though it didn't work out when I was six, God never gave up on me and my family. It's a miracle. So the aspect, that another aspect of our Christianity is it's miraculous. But then also the aspect of it is a humbling. Look at Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14. It is humbling.
Look at verse 10. Luke 14, verse 10 says this. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, come up, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Humbly. The fact is that, that God would love me, that God would care about me, that God would send his only begotten son for me, that God would allow his only son to be rejected and beaten and humiliated and mocked and denied and pierced for me? I don't deserve that. Thank God His grace, thank God His mercy reached out to me. He said, if you will take this gift, you can open it up. And all the things that you are dealing with right now, you're not going to ever have to deal with that ever by yourself again. That's pretty humbling. That God would love me so much. That God would love you so much. We don't want to ever take for granted or expect things from God that we don't deserve. But He gives it to us anyway. Just think that God of all the creations, the one that spoke this world into existence, that gives us the four seasons, and he gives us the rain, he gives us all the different things, he gives us breath, he gives us life, he gives us strength, he gives us our provisions, he gives us so many different things that God would look at us on an individual basis and say, I love you. Not for who we are, but because of who you are, I love you. It would be pretty humbling. And so as we look at this Palm Sunday, with all the revelry and all the excitement, as we meditate and we think about the, the different aspects of Holy Week, culminating in next Sunday where he's alive, they tried to put him down. They tried to get rid of him. They tried to remove him. They even paid the soldiers to say, just lie. And that same lie has been going on for 2,000 years. He is alive. He is well. No one stole his body. He came out by himself. But he did it because of you. Because of me. He became flesh. That's pretty humbling to me. And I thank God for that. So even in our unkept state, God says, I still love you. Even in the state of all the sin and wickedness that we're doing in our lives, God says, I still love you. I still care about you. And I want you as my child. And when we become his child, he says, you know what? I'm still going to be with you. And yes, I'm still going to love you no matter what you are, because I love you, not your actions. See, I grew up in a single home for a while until mom met dad and they got married and they dealt with lawyers. You know, one thing about lawyers is they always want money. When dad was working, was in the Marine Corps, he wasn't making a lot of money. And so I'm going to adopt you, I'm going to adopt you, I'm going to adopt you, I'm going to adopt you. Well, I was at Divine Heart Seminary, Donaldson, Indiana. But it was a Tuesday night in February of 1977. Father Gaelic sent for me, and he was in his room. It was about 8 o'clock at night. I was down at the, at the um, place where all the guys were hanging out playing basketball and having a good time. And got, when you got called to his office at night, you knew you were in trouble. And so I walked to his room. I said, Father Gaelic, is there everything okay? He said, sit down. Yes, sir. Do you know what I've called you here for? I said, no, sir. He said, how do you feel by living in a home with someone with a different name. I didn't have thought much about it. He said, do you, do you feel complete? I said, well, now that you think about it, no. Because I'm still carrying my mom's last name of Rearer, but I'm living in a friar's home. 
He said, have you ever dealt with any type of bias against you because you have different names all the time? He said, how would you feel if I told you that you don't have to worry about that again because what you've been hoping and praying for is now signed, sealed, delivered. All you have to do is take this piece of paper. And I started crying. I jumped out of the seat. Where's that piece of paper? I want it now. I took it and I saw James Charles Augustine Fryer. So where's the rare name? It's no longer in existence, Jim. You mean I'm no I'm always a friar from according to this piece of paper, it goes all the way back to your birth. You're now a friar now. And may I say that when you got saved, you had the name that was not of God. Because there's two fathers in this world. When you got saved, your heavenly father took, your, took you, placed you into his family, and whatever past you had, it was forgiven, forgotten forever, and now you carry the name of God on your life for eternity. And all you had to do was to take the piece of paper and accept it. Everything else is paid for. Thank God for that. So let me encourage you. Thank God for your salvation. Take some time during this holy week to just say, Jesus, thank you. What an amazing God we serve. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. With head bowed and eyes closed, Christians praying. Let me ask just a couple of questions. First question is a pastor. I know that I know that I know I'm on my way to heaven. I'm born again. Can I see your hands a testimony? God bless you. I appreciate that. You may put your hands down. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Second question is to say, Pastor, something in the message spoke to my heart. Would you please pray with me? Can I see your hand? I know my hand is up. I need to be, I need to pray too. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. Then we're going to stand. I'm going to have a few moments of invitation. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is here. So he is here right now with us. This is your chance to talk to him. He's here. Maybe you just need to thank him for the adoption. Maybe you thank him for your sins being forgiven. Maybe the fact that he's provided you a place called heaven in the future. Maybe he's given you peace. Maybe he's given you cover. Maybe, whatever it is, maybe it's just time to stop and say thank you, Jesus. This is your time to talk with him. Let's do business with him. Father, we gave the message. Bless this invitation. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's all stand with head bowed, nice clothes, Christians praying. If you need to use an old-fashioned altar, it's here. But where you're at, just take some time and talk to him. The way of the cross leads home. Let's rise on the cross. Without that cross, we have no hope whatsoever. But it's going to lead us home. You may be seated with head bowed and eyes closed. You're at the altar. Take your time.
praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Folks, I love you. Appreciate you. Oh, I, I love this part of the year. It just brings me back always to never forget the great gift of eternal life. Take some time this week. Meditate on it. Pray about it. Thank God for it. Because with that, we would be very miserable people. Services start tonight at 5, 530. And so let's be faithful. We can. Wednesday night prayer meeting at 7 o'clock. You have any prayer requests, let us know. We're praying for that. A lot of, lot of prayer requests, a lot of broken hearts. Let's pray like we've never prayed before. And we pray more than that, even so, come quickly. Wouldn't it be great for Jesus to come back right now? Thank God for that. But until then, we're just going to keep on keeping on. Let's all stand as we are dismissed. And Brother Bob, can you take us to the Lord's throne, please? Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for all he's did and will do. I ask, Lord, for your help as we go through our days. Help us to do what we need to do. Just thank you for everything. Amen. Amen.